Hello to everyone. I want to introduce um, the League of Women Voters uh, budget study group. Uh, Linda Links and Michelle Bell and myself. This is a one-year effort uh, interspersed with grandkids, trips, and uh, life. So um, what we're doing here today is um, we're going to um, talk about how things have changed from uh, 2010 when we did our last um, budget study to 2018. At times we'll bring in some information on 2019, but uh, basically it's 2010 to 2018. In 2010, we spent a year or perhaps even longer uh, studying the budget. And the questions that we uh, were concerned with and, and uh, worked on were, where do the dollars come from to run the county? How are they spent? What is the process uh, for making budget decisions? And what opportunities do <coughs> citizens have uh, to make input to the budget process? Uh, when we did that 2010 study, we went out into the community and um, we held uh, small briefings uh, to explain the, uh, the county budget to uh, citizens. And uh, for that, we received an award from the State League of Women Voters. So um, a lot has changed in the last eight years, and what we wanted to do was we wanted to just update and see where we were. So now I'm going to attempt to operate this. Uh, oh, just get to us. Ah, fantastic. Thank you, Amy. So this is uh, what our agenda is. May look like a lot, but I think we can get through this pretty quickly. So here's what has not changed. You can only balance a budget by reducing expenditures, increasing revenue, or by spending the fund balance or the rainy day fund. This was presented when we did our 2010 and it uh, continues forward today. So now we're gonna look at the total adopted budget uh, comparing 2010 to 2018. So what we've got there, it's, is it showing up? The top line should be red. It doesn't seem, perhaps we could turn off some lights here. It might be a little better if we could. Um, might be able to see a little better. Does anyone know where the lights are? Yeah. Okay. So the the top line in 2010 there is uh, the general fund. Uh, the blue below there is um, is the, are the special funds, and then um, likewise for t uh, 2018. What happened that it changed so drastically? Comparing 2010 to um, uh, 2018 for the special funds is primarily the big change there of 27 million is because um, of the um, Belfair wastewater uh, uh, reclamation fund. We're going to call it the Belfair sewer system because then you're going to know what I'm talking about. But if you were to go in and look into the accounting records that uh, Frank and uh, Jennifer have and uh, also Patty, you would look for the Belfair Wastewater Reclamation Facility. It would be, it would be called that. Uh, so in those monies, that $27 million was paid out long ago. Uh, I think that I think yes. that's better. Yes. Do you agree? Okay. Then in the general fund, we see that there's 10 million more in the general fund, and um, we're going to look at that a little uh, a little deeper here. So uh, let's move on to the next chart. What we want to do here is give uh, give you some uh, idea of what's in the special funds and uh, the difference of special funds and general funds. The special funds are plural. That is 43 different funds that are established for a specific purpose. The largest one for 2019 is the road fund at $30 million. 
And uh, it was 22 million in 2010. Uh, in 22, 2010, uh, also, as I mentioned, uh, Belfair Sewer was larger. Today, that fund is $2 million, uh, or was for the budget. And the general fund, there we go, general fund, that's to cover day-to-day -day expenses. And you'll see there, it tells you, um, gives you an idea of what those funds are. Um, let's go on here. Mostly what we're going to be talking about today is going to be the general fund. So here we go. General fund revenues. The adopted budget for 2010 compared to the adopted budget for 2018. You see there, the line share of our revenues come from taxes and the taxes in there are both mainly mainly for property tax and uh, for sales tax that's what comprises that number uh, mainly and uh, property taxes are about double the sales tax now this chart is going to require a little bit more of an explanation. So let's look at this. What I want you to try to do, please, is to uh, imagine that you own a piece of property in the county, that's on the left side, and on the right side, you own a piece of property in the city. In the city. So these two pieces of property were taken from the 2010 study that we did. And what we did at that time, we went to the assessor's office and said, give us a sampling of properties that are right around $200,000. And so we used that in 2010. We picked two pieces of property there. And what we had asked them is, of those properties, that sampling you give us, please have one for each school district within the county. And so this county example here is in the Pioneer School District. And the city example is in, of course, the Shelton School District. So let's look at this. Overall, if you are that homeowner, that property owner in the county, residing in the Pioneer School District, you have seen your property taxes go up 44%. If you are in the city, you've seen it go up 37% over this eight year time frame. <clears throat> A large part of that in both cases is the state school tax, the total state school tax. And we all know that for the McCleary decision, we paid a little extra last year. The local school taxes for both have gone up considerably more by a proportion within the Pioneer School District. Well, within the Pioneer School District, I can tell you they had a voter approved bond and they had increases to their levy taxes. Likewise, within the city, the Shelton School District had uh, a bond, a voter-approved bond that, that has increased that. Now, what we are told is uh, for 2019 and out, we're going to see less in the state school tax. We, we will see a drop in that. Also, we should see within the local school tax, we should see a reduction there because we are only going to be paying for the enrichment levy. So as it is today, a lot more is collected on, from the local levy than will be once this McCleary is all worked in. Uh, for the county general fund, you see that it's gone up 13% for, in the county example, and the, the uh, city also pays a portion 
to the county for services that they get that, that the county provides to the city. You don't see within the city example roads and there's a reason because it is included in the city of Shelton taxes. Another large element that you see there, stub that you see uh, within the city example is the Shelton Park District. That was a voter approved municipal park district uh, increase. So the voters said yes. It went out and they said yes. And that's what, that's what um, we're all about here in this democracy that we live in. The road diversion dollars, that 136% there, let me explain what road diversion means in um, layman's terms. What that means is Sheriff Salisbury's staff, his officers, his deputies, do traffic policing. And so some dollars are coming from the road fund to the sheriff's office to, to pay for that, for that service. Uh, it has gone up. I, I can't tell you how much it was in 2010, and let me explain why. In the middle of this period, this <coughs> eight-year time frame, a new accounting system came into effect within the county. And that's part of why this was especially difficult for us to do this comparison because it is uh, labor intensive for uh, county employees to go back into this 2010 file and pull this information out. But I can tell you for road diversion in 2015 it was 1.2 million. In 2018 it went up to 2.2 one six million so it increased quite a bit in 2018 in 2016 and 17 it was really uh, one just one and a half million so the first time that I can recall on a property tax statement that I received from our treasurer Lisa Frazier first time that I noted that was last year on my property tax statement it said this percent you're paying for road diversion. So you might look at that. That will help you to understand where your property tax dollars are going. So when that statement comes out, take a look at it. There's a lot of information there. And I think it's uh, fantastic, Lisa, that we are now getting that, that additional information. So um, I believe that at this point, um, Commissioner Shuddy, you had something that you wanted to talk about regarding the levy lid lift. And we'll t if you uh, would like to take a couple of minutes, a minute or two, to explain to us where you stand on that. Well, I'd probably let you go through the rest of your presentation. Would you like to do it like it. that? Yeah, I mean, I think I'd okay. prefer okay, to fine. let you go through and address questions and comments after the presentation. Okay, so as I look at this, 44% and 37 percent and I will tell you I have gone into each of these properties in the database those properties have not gone up considerably they're still eight years later those properties are still two hundred thousand dollars right around that now if I am if I'm paying property taxes an increase like that on that piece of property have I seen my income go up proportionally <laughs> that's a question I'm just laying out there I don't know the answer because those aren't my properties but that's a question that I would uh, just um, let sit <clears throat> sales tax so this is uh, about half of what the property taxes are so for 2019 it's going to be it's estimated that about five million dollars will come in for this so um, if you're buying something that's um, qualified 
in the county, it's eight dollars and fifty cents. But if you're buying something in the city, it's eight dollars and eighty cents. What's been added, looking comparing 2010 to 2019, <coughs> is the mental health tax of ten cents. When we did the study back in 2010, it was eight dollars and forty cents. So now we're at eight fifty. The city added. Um, 10 cents for um, public safety, and they added, uh, they have an additional 20 cents for Mason Transit. So recall on the previous chart that for property taxes, the city of Shelton has not had to increase considerably their property tax because they're collecting more in sales tax more than likely. If you were to go to the city of Olympia, you'd pay 8.9%. So now we're going to talk about expenditures. So on this um, chart, we've got the um, different functions the general government, judicial, public safety, and, and what these are, these elements that you see there on the chart, within the budget accounting system, there is a way to roll this up and to categorize it. And that's what this is. So, so let's look at it. General government has gone down 4% as a percent of total. It's gone down 4% over this period. Judicial has gone down 3%. Public safety has gone up 5 But let's look here at culture and recreation. It has dropped 2%. Now here's what that 2% reduction means. Primarily to parks. Parks and recreation. That's primarily what that is. That 2% reduction is about $200,000 less that the county has to spend on the parks. And you know what? There's a, that shows you that if it comes to uh, prioritizing public safety versus um, parks, public safety is going to have a higher priority. And that's, that's uh, I think, the reality of, uh, of where we are. And here are the expenditures by type. So what we see there is that salaries and benefits have gone down 2%. But we also see that service contracts have gone up 8%. One thing that I think is a, um, a really positive change as I look at and compare the information systems that have developed within the county is that you now, within the county, you separate out salaries and benefits. You highlight that. And because it's such a large portion of the overall county budget, because it's being paid attention to, I think you're going to see as we go further into this briefing that it has made a difference in how the county's budget is being managed. So. As the number of uh, people in the offices and the elected officials um, has dropped, <coughs> uh, service contracts have gone up. And uh, so while it's positive in one respect that salaries and benefits have gone down, I have to wonder, have the service contracts now been a requirement to get out there and and complete that work 
that those services that must be performed. Now, if on the positive side, if this work that must be done, these services that must be provided, if that is essential, if you're doing it through personal services, through contracts, you're not having to pay the uh, retirement benefits. Perhaps you're not having to pay for uh, health care. So there's probably, looking at it from just um, a customer's perspective, this could be, this could be positive. So uh, recall I said that you can see how um, the counties um, changed or adjusted to, um, to live within the dollars that are provided, that the revenue that you have. When we looked at the budget in 2009, Part of the reason why we got into that was because the ending fund balance had dropped so low. And there was concern that, um, that perhaps we, we were dropping too low. And so you see there that in 2010 and um, for, for several months, I mean for several years, the uh, fund balance stayed pretty high. And then in 2015, it dropped. From 2015 to 2016, it dropped. But it's back up at the end of 2018 at 7.8 million. Um, so it's almost doubled. And what I'm told is that there's a, a couple of things that have contributed to, to this um, considerably higher uh, ending fund balance than was expected. What was expected in the preliminary budget, which would have been last summer, was 5.9 million. Um, so it's coming in at 7.8 million. And what, uh, what we're told is that that came in because it came in higher because of very careful management of the budget and um, additional revenue that was found. But while that is really good, what you have to ask is, did, did we let people go when we were preparing the 2017 budget that we could have kept had we known or been able to forecast that revenue was going to come in higher. Perhaps we could have kept some people. Uh, one of the things that I want to highlight that is very positive was that um, the county now has a resolution that was adopted in 2017 that would have the ending fund balance for 2018 at 12 to 15% of uh, 2017 expenditures. <coughs> so the target there was <coughs> 3.9 to 4.9 million dollars. So they, they, really, they really exceeded that. So let's move on to organizational changes that occurred between 2008 and 2018. So the um, county reduced uh, 10 directors to three. They combined uh, public health and community development into the Department of Community Services. They combined uh, public works and utilities waste management into the Department of Public Works and Utilities and combined central services uh, into the Department of Support Services. All three of these departments work for the Board of County Commissioners. And you see here, these charts may be very difficult for you to read, I don't know. Um, 
bottom line here is from 2008 to 2018, 27 full-time equivalent positions were eliminated. That's a um, pretty, pretty high number there. And I think as we're looking at this, um, from a citizen's perspective, the question has to be, are we receiving um, adequate services? Are the services adequate? Then there are some reductions that occurred uh, reporting to other elected officials, the assessor, auditor, and treasurer. So these three offices have lost 13.2 full-time equivalent positions. And they've done that through reduced hours. And there's been a lot of discussion about that you know, the reduced hours and the, the days that it's closed. And again, the question is for, for the public, are you receiving adequate services? So if you're receiving adequate services, then obviously um, this, is, this is working. So that's a question I think that um, we have to ask. Has the one thing that comes to my mind, having having gone through periods of time when there are large reductions, is um, you get into a point that you get understaffed, and um, you start seeing higher turnover. So that would be a question that I'd have to ask: Is uh, are we seeing higher turnover? So we're going to talk about just a couple of funds in the special funds. And the first one is um, the Belfair Sewer. Once again, that what the title of the chart is uh, what you would find if you were to go into the accounting system. But the Belfair Sewer was established in 2012. In 2012 and 2013, there were audit findings that uh, said this uh, sewer system is not sustainable with the current number of users and rates that are being paid. And so what the county has done now for several years is um, transferred funds from the sales and use tax fund, the .09, and the real estate excise tax two fund to cover shortfalls. So um, the real estate excise tax fund is um, when you go to uh, purchase a piece of property, you pay an excise tax. And that excise tax, a portion of that, comes into this um, real estate excise tax to fund, which is for Growth Management Act planning. And it covers, both of these funds cover infrastructure that uh, infrastructure needs within uh, the county. So here is, since 2016, here is how this um, has been subsidized. So you see there, I believe that um, the payment, the loan payment is right around $1.2 million. Uh, for the, the sewer, for the money we've borrowed. So for the money we've borrowed, we are now at a point since 2008, for 2018 and 2019 that these funds, the REIT 2 and the .09 money, are virtually paying for the loan for this sewer system. Now I want to just say here that if we were to have dug into this fund properly, we would have needed another year to study this. This is very complicated. 
And uh, I would recommend to the league that if you're looking for something to study, this might be one that you can take on. And if you do decide to do that, I have a folder that I can share with you. <laughs> so, uh, but this, this is something that when you start digging into it and you start looking at it, really getting into it and looking at it, you start realizing that we're now at a point that if we want to keep the environment healthy, if we want to uh, continue to be uh, viable, and I'm talking you know, financially viable as a county, all of us now have, we have uh, some um, buy-in on this. We have to. If this, if, if those loans are not covered, it could be disastrous for the county. We can go in and look throughout the United States. There are examples of uh, other cities, try Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where they have just, you know, it's just crushed them. You can't, this could make us go bankrupt. So while these dollars, these read two dollars and the sales and use tax dollars are going to, a large portion of them are going to this welfare sewer system and taking, stealing dollars that we could use, diverting, stealing's not the right word, but diverting dollars from other infrastructure without, within the county. The reality is today that we have that sewer system. And we've got these loans, they're general obligation bo uh, bonds, which means all of us, whether we live in Belfair or not, we are responsible for paying those bonds. Then there's the Russell Wood. This one, I have to tell you, I was surprised to see that that pop up. Russell Wood now also must be stabilized. And so read two dollars are going there to stabilize Russell Wood. So this is why I say this is a prime target for a study. So uh, what we've got here are just some um, questions that you might want to consider. And one of them is uh, about the biennial budget. Given that we do so many uh, supplementals in a year, what it would be the value of a biennial budget? Just a question to pose out there. Uh, another question that I think is just like um, another one that we could have spent many more months studying would have been the jail. Is our jail adequate? How many people, how many prisoners can be housed in this current jail? Those are some of the questions that as citizens and as property tax payers, we need to be thinking about. Um, and encouraging our elected officials to study. What capacity should a new jail have? Could it be, con uh, could it be contracted out? Those are all those uh, questions that uh, our elected representatives um, are probably struggling with today. Then uh, the question about Russell Wood and Belfair. And then uh, a fourth one would be the uh, funding postage for voters to return their ballots. Uh, as league members, voting is huge to us. It is what we are about. Um, and the vo uh, funding for the voters brochure that's another one that, um, as we have talked, is, is really big on our list of priorities. But of course, at the same time, we hasten to add, we understand that you have priorities and that you have mandates. So um, that completes uh, the briefing. So um, would you like to then go ahead, Kevin? Sure, sure. Um, I'm going to slide over here. I want to have my... Sorry, I'm back to you. <laughs> uh, first off, I
uh, say thanks to the league for uh, hosting this uh, conversation today. Brenda, I appreciate you taking the, uh, the time and effort to put together uh, the briefing today. And I also want to just uh, call out the members of the Citizens Budget Advisory Committee uh, for their work uh, over, over several months in 2018. It was really uh, quite a task that they willingly stepped up to take on. Um, you know, the, as you can see, finances and the budget can be complex. Uh, now try fitting that into one or two meetings a month for a couple hours and trying to come back with um, recommendations. And they did that. They did that. Uh, they sacrificed their time uh, to, to make those recommendations to us. And we're very grateful for it. Also want to acknowledge uh, staff that's here with us today, uh, Frank and Jennifer. Um, they are they're, appreciate them taking the lunch hour to be here with us today, but also for all of their work uh, day in and day out on the budget. Budget cycle isn't just from when we get the preliminary budget in August through you know, when we adopt it in December. Budget cycle is year round. We're constantly, constantly tracking the budget, tracking our revenue in an effort to uh, make sure we're spending your tax dollars uh, wisely. Uh, I want to address a, a couple of points just real briefly, and, and I'm actually more interested uh, in hearing your questions and, and maybe running through the, the suggested questions here in the presentation. One, uh, you know, I think it's important to put things in context. We're in a very different place than we were in 2010, and that's, if, that's based on just looking at the economy as a whole. Uh, if you look at 2010, it was right on the, the, the hills, the aftermath uh, of the um, Great Recession. In a lot of places haven't uh, didn't recover as quickly as others. You look across the sound in Seattle and you look at their economic growth and you compare it to counties like ours, rural counties, um, you know, certainly we have lagged uh, in terms of capturing that economic boom that they've had over the past few years. But we're very different economically now than we were in 2010. Uh, and, and, and so that's part of the context. The other thing that I think it's important to note, voter, uh, Based on a voter-approved initiative, property taxes can only go up 1% per year. So I'd, I'd be interested in having a further conversation with, with Brenda on, on some of those uh, property tax uh, increases that, that uh, were referenced in the presentation earlier. Because I think, um, you know, like I said, there was a voter-approved initiative that said we can only consider a 1% property tax increase uh, uh, per year unless we go out and get voter approval, which is uh, one of the other issues that the uh, Citizens Budget Advisory Committee uh, took under consideration uh, throughout their work last year, and one of the they made a number of recommendations, and, and uh, really a lot of thought went into it, um, considering revenue options uh, for the for the commission to consider this year, uh, including a three tenths of one percent public safety sales tax. I know that was part of the presentation here. You see how our sales tax compares uh, to the city of Shelton. Uh, how it compares, um, we heard reference, made reference to uh, sales tax in Olympia. So that's one of the options. We could do a single year, multi-year levy lid lift, which is which increases our share of the state total the, um, ceiling that we're allowed to, uh, that, that is allowed to be collected. Uh, that would have to be a, a vote of the people as well. Uh, the other recommendation they made was uh, Metropolitan Parks District, which as you call was on the ballot uh, a couple of years ago in 2016. Uh, and there are a couple of different things to consider with that that would, they would have to be uh, determined prior to putting something on the ballot. Um, ultimately, you know, we're going to have to have a conversation as a commission as to what uh, amongst those uh, options we want to uh, consider further this year. And, and I um, anticipate that we'll be having that conversation later this month as we get into briefings. Uh, further about uh, the report that was presented to us. If you haven't read the report, it's on our web page. Uh, I encourage you to go and, and take a look at it. It's on the front page under the what's what's happening section. Uh, it's it's a it's a good quick read. It's only a few pages long, so you know if you're looking for some good bedtime reading material, highly encourage you to check that one out. Uh, and so that's that sort of is the you know the the, the frame for us to consider uh, <coughs> revenue options. Uh, this year, and of course, is can't overstate it. You have the ultimate say. You have the ultimate say uh, if it goes on the ballot. So um, that's that's uh, the power that's inherent uh, with the voters uh, here in the state. Another kind of important thing to remember is we are uh, counties, I should say, are uh, agents of the state. 
we're not treated the same as cities. We're not. We don't have a lot of the a lot of the uh, opportunities and abilities that cities have. We are everything we do is given to us by the state. Kind of a thankless position to be in sometimes uh, when you're relying upon the legislature uh, and and, uh, and when they look at what their prior priorities are and where county government, where local government fits into that. It's not always in line with what we think is best uh, for local government, um, in particular when it comes to law and justice. Uh, so keep that in mind. We don't, have, we don't have the ability to declare bankruptcy as a county. We're not incorporated. We're not an incorporated municipality. Uh, Brenda referenced Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Uh, that's an Act 47 city in Pennsylvania, so the state is coming in and bailing them out. Uh, they have to put together a financial plan to get themselves out of that hole. Uh, and you know it's uh, it's not something that in counties in Washington uh, it's, it's it's not an apples to apples comparison, but it does speak to the larger sort of systemic issues that we have to deal with um, here in our state. In particular, as we look at our infrastructure costs and we look at uh, the costs of, of the simple costs of doing business. So, uh, as was mentioned in the in the presentation, uh, the driver of that, quite frankly, is labor. Uh, you know, and the, the, the salaries and benefits side of the budget is what drives uh, everything that we do in the county. And so, uh, to the extent possible, we have to have a, we, I was a member of ASME for five and a half years, so don't interpret this as some sort of, you know, anti-union sentiment on my part, but we have to be realistic when we deal with our labor unions and we go through those negotiations because, uh, you know, the contracts that we negotiate today could lead to uh, consequences where we see reductions in staff uh, years down the line. And so um, we've had we've had I think a very good relationship with our uh, collective bargaining units, our labor units. I think we have a total of 12 now collective bargaining units. So a lot of moving pieces. And, and Frank is our chief negotiator on that. And you know I think he's he's done a, a good job at representing the reality uh, that we have financially. And so that's an ongoing. Uh, that's an ongoing thing that requires a lot of our uh, attention and a lot of uh, forward thinking, frankly. Uh, it's not about budgeting or adopting a, uh, a collective bargaining agreement. It, 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 it matters certainly for the year that you're in, but it matters more in, in year two, three, and four uh, as the labor file wave is, is out there. And so um, we try to be mindful of that when we have uh, those deliberations. And, and I think our unions have shown a willingness to uh, work with us, and I hope that that continues into the future. Um, so I, I think uh, those are some of the, the highlights that I wanted to hit. Um, I'm happy to go through and give my uh, my thoughts on some of those questions. Uh, and just kind of the, the caveat to all of this, I'm one of three. I'm the one talking right now. Uh, my opinions represent my opinions, uh, not necessarily, although hopefully in some cases do represent a majority consensus yes. on, the, on the commission. But uh, it's important to note that if you have particular questions and want to hear from an individual commissioner, um, it, you know, it's, it's always good to reach out to that individual commissioner and, and ask them directly what their thoughts are uh, on, on any given issue. So uh, I'll just take them in order here. You know, I was a proponent of moving to a two-year biennial budget, still am. Uh, you know, the, 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 the benefit to a biennial budget, in my opinion, uh, it's not going to help us necessarily put more money into our, our checking account. But what it helps is it in the out year gives you an opportunity to do planning and evaluation of the programs and services that you're uh, that you're offering and providing in the county. Uh, other counties that do it, um, there's there's uh, our neighbor in Thurston County does it. Pierce County is moving to a biennial budget. Um, we see uh, I think uh, statewide over 50 cities and counties uh, have a two-year budget uh, as well as uh, the state. So if it's good enough to work on a 51 billion dollar. Uh, budget at the state level. There are ways that we can make it work for us here in Mason County, and, and so I continue to be a supporter of that because it gives our staff, it gives it gives them the ability to, to take to take a step back in that out year, evaluate all the work that we're doing, uh, and then it, it helps us kind of project out a little bit more so that we're not thinking uh, we're not just thinking two years and you know, you know ahead of us, but we're we're really looking at at biennia now. We're looking at, at four plus years out in terms of how we spend and. Uh, and how we um, manage those uh, cost drivers like collective bargaining agreements. Since those aren't done year to year, those are multi-year contracts, um, it makes a lot of sense to me to, to be able to have um, a similar approach to our, our budget since that is such a big driver. 
Uh, moving on to the second question here. Uh, absolutely, I do believe that we need to have uh, a serious conversation about a new jail in our community. I, when I was running two years ago, I, I talked quite a bit about that and has been working on that uh, collaboratively as the uh, chair of the criminal justice working team for the county. So that brings together folks in the judicial side, that brings together uh, law enforcement um, and, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth on, on the criminal justice side of our budget. And uh, I'm happy to report that I had, uh, I had a lot of support on the commission last year and going forward this year with a request for qualifications on a joint facility project with Grays Harbor County. Um, we have received a number of applicants, uh, architectural and engineering firms that can help us through that process that we're currently evaluating. Um, it, would, it would be uh, basically a three-pronged um, uh, approach for us in Grays Harbor County. One, it would look at a standalone facility in Grays Harbor County. It would look at a standalone facility in Mason County, and it would look at the feasibility of a joint regional facility uh, with uh, shared responsibility between us and Grace Harbor County. And as we look at as we look at the sort of systematic issues that we have in local government that are handed down to us from the state, we're going to be forced to, for good reason, in many cases, look at regional partnerships in order to provide services for people. Uh, throughout our area. Um, Grays Harbor is, uh, is no different than us in terms of you know, dealing with the same issues. They have aging infrastructure, aging facilities, growing needs, uh, and so we have to be able to vet ideas that, uh, that include partnerships across county lines. Criminals don't necessarily, uh, you know, I'm not going to go commit a crime in Grays Harbor County. They don't think about county lines. You know, so we can't either. We need, to think, we need to think a little bit more broadly about how we enter into partnerships and what benefit that can that can bring to the community? Uh, so in the in the coming months here, we'll be evaluating that, and, and I know that um, that's that's going to be a priority of mine heading through this year and, and beyond. Um, you know, as far as the jail capacity is concerned, you know, the reality of that is, uh, it, you know, the reality is that the sheriff has capped it at 80. Uh, I would encourage you to have the sheriff's office in to discuss uh, the reasoning behind that. Um, I have taken the approach that. Whether, whether we're at 80 or 144 or some number in between, uh, that does not remove our responsibility to consider uh, a, new, a new jail building. Um, simply the, the infrastructure is outmoded for our needs in the county. Uh, yeah, if I could just yeah. interrupt, Kevin, let's uh, perhaps get the other, if other commissioners want to address these two issues or whatever they may want to address. Oh, I'm still pretty new. <laughs> And um, obviously now with our, our budget team, uh, and a large budget, so there's a lot to cover him. But I look forward to, to understanding it more um, and looking into ways that we can help our citizens. We have a lot of outstanding warrants, a lot of uh, people committing crimes, and so we need to find ways to, to solve that as well. But I do look forward to, to working with staff and getting into the budget, learning, understanding it a lot more. Uh, Commissioner Trask, I, I didn't add, I didn't uh, mention today <coughs> that when we did our report uh, in 2010, one of the things that, one of the recommendations we made was uh, a citizens advisory board or group. And uh, so uh, we appreciate that, that you have uh, formed that that group and see value in it. Right, and for me, one of the, the bonuses of running during the primary and during the general was being able to attend those meetings. Yeah. They were very educational. I would, I would recommend that if you know, we have another one that you come in and if you're, don't, if you're not on the panel, sit there and listen to, to the different issues because different departments came in and spoke and it was very informative. Right. Uh, Commissioner Nettleman. Uh, First of all, I want to make clear, Mr. Schutte is the one representing the county. I'm just here as a guest, as the other commissioner is, so uh, not that I'm saying it's official. I can tell you some of the things that I, I noticed in, in your presentation, I can share with you what I know about the field. For example, uh, we saw the big dip in uh, revenue uh, from you know, 7 and 8 area down to 4.1. Uh, during that time, we had uh, $3.4 million over a three-year period that was overexpended above the budget that we had to do in supplementals. 
for one particular department, and that it, in a way of, at that, uh, we also increased the budget in that department in order to try and overcome that supplemental issue the next year didn't work, because uh, the, the same issue occurred for another two million. But also, as you've seen at the end, uh, we had that year where we had to make the adjustments. We literally had basically a 7% decrease in revenue in the one year. That was the big shocker that, that changed everything. Uh, uh, you know, if you take out the 2009 numbers, we're doing about 6% a year, then we're almost negative one uh, for, for revenue. That had a huge impact. So you got to remember, if you're going to cut the budget, you can't just cut by 7%. A lot of the money is money in, money out. So you can only take that 7% over a smaller portion of the people receiving the funds, and so the cuts are deeper than 7% in, into those. To share that with you, I wanted to also share that uh, counties are different than cities as we can't be K. Uh, we're not a municipal corporation. So we're stuck. That's just the way that, that kind of works. Uh, I'm curious to see the, the city, because I was a little surprised on their numbers. I'm wondering if uh, if that 1%, because I know it, for since I've been here, they've taken that 1%, right? But I can't remember the time when they did take the 1%. I'm wondering if there's an offset because their park district, because they actually change their funds around to, to take money from the parks district, and it goes directly to their funds. Or uh, did they make their adjustment? Because the numbers you're using for us, uh, our big hit was 2009. That's when we had a, a giant hit from the economy. I wonder if they hit their, adjusted their budget earlier than that. And so it doesn't show the big hit like, like ours. But uh, uh, also I wanted to point out uh, something that was pretty interesting is that some point uh, you're seeing now is actually better than it, it looks because up until this year, we didn't have, we have a uh, 13th month. Right. So one of the things that I remember when I came in looking at $8 million in the bank, and you're not even a couple weeks into it, it dropped down to five. It's like, what happened? Yeah. Well, there's the 13th month. There's things that occur on that. Uh, that, with the advice of, for example, our treasurer next to us, we have audit committee, uh, there was, the advice was to do away with that, and the whole county readjusted to that this last year. And so the number you've seen this time, that is the number, because there is no 13th month going to take away the, the funds from that. So those are just some of the things I saw that I would point out. Do you think I should go to the, should we carry on with the next slide? Or what do you, what is your, go to the next slide? Okay. Some of us are bursting with questions. questions. Were you yeah. ready? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Can <laughs> we we'll take some questions? And yeah. Then, yeah. You yeah. focus on timing, Brenda, so okay. do you When do we want to have this in? <laughs> Well, we have to be done by 1.30, but okay. people are here over their lunch hours. Sure, and kind of sure. And then as people have to leave, we understand. So um, the are burning gonna, Are we going to get an opportunity to talk about the Citizens Committee? Um, we, I think we first need, we have addressed it to some point. And what we need to do now, I think, is our members need to ask their questions. Okay, let me say very frankly. With the exception of Commissioner Trask, Lisa, Frank, and Jennifer, I don't see anybody in this room who ever took the time to attend any one of the 11 public hearings we had to discuss the budget and recommendations for the budget. Okay, thank you. And so, that would have been very helpful to a lot of you. So. Uh, perhaps we could talk offline and you could tell me the errors in this. All errors that are in this briefing. Not no, excuse errors. me, sir. Excuse me, sir. If there are any errors in this briefing here, I'm responsible for them and I, I'll say it's all contributed to my broken hand, okay? <laughs> so let's move on and get some of the questions that others may have. Please I, have I have uh, one for the commissioners and one for you, Brenda. Um, the, for the commissioners, it might help to know which, what are the boundaries of your districts and how does the public uh, communicate to, for instance, if I run into Sharon and she's not my commissioner, is it a waste of time to tell her what my problem might be or that sort of thing, I'd like to know that. And uh, for, for Brenda, uh, can you give me an approximate number for the monetary difference between the 30% tax 
tax and the 40 plus percent tax city versus county is that is there a is there a way to know is that a zillion dollars or is it that uh, uh, you know a hundred thousand dollars how does that how does that difference uh, compare yeah. and you probably know what some sort of average is in there I, I can't answer you right now I'd have to go back in and uh, pull that data but okay. I could because I have okay. the, oh, right. I have you, could, you and I could talk yeah okay and uh, uh, is the the loss of those 37 27 employees a loss of institutional memory is is the uh, increase in contracts privatizing as opposed to having career uh, you know the public servants in our in our government uh, I sort of trust people who have been in the departments more than I trust somebody who's getting contract work to do it I, I throw that one open so your boundaries and how can we how can, shall we trust the employees versus contract workers and that sort of thing. So for, for the boundaries, I'll start there. My, my district is essentially the entire western half of the county. It's a lot of, it's a lot of area. Um, we're all split up about 20,000 people per district, but I got, I got that national forest in my part, my district, so it kind of makes up, you know, territory-wise, it's, it's pretty big. Um, you know, and as far as, con I, I think it helps if you contact all of us, you know, I mean, if you, you're not, you're not, you know, shouting into a vacuum if you talk to a commissioner that's not, you know, from the district that you not live in. Because um, are you guys, do you have to live in your We area? do, we have to live in the district. Um, we're, our primaries are by district, uh, but we're general, our general election is countywide, and so by virtue of that, you know, and, and, and by virtue of, of the work, you know, we don't just do a budget for our district, we do a budget for the whole county. And so by virtue of that, we're, you know, we're happy to work on, um, issues that, that are brought to us by people from outside of our district. And I'll, I'll just, I'll sort of, the caveat to that is if, you know, if you were to come to me with a particular issue and you lived in Commissioner Netherlands district, um, I would, in, in, out of deference to uh, it being something happening in his district, I would, I would bring it to him in one of our open briefings and, and give him a chance to take a shot at it. Um, you know, but, it, but certainly on issues that are significant countywide, so, you know, it's fine to talk to the three of us. Um, and then what was the second question was oh, about uh, institutional knowledge. Yeah. So typically as it is, you know, when you lose, when you lose um, uh, represented staff, so people you know, that are in, under a union, you know, they typically take the newest person first who leaves by seniority. So I, I can't speak to every situation. I can't speak to every, you know, for the past, you know, eight or nine years. But generally speaking, if you're losing a represented person, seniority plays a big part in, in you know, in how they I appreciate yeah. that point of view at least, but so I, reassuring. Yeah. Um, well, I, I'm just wondering, um, Lisa, since you're putting you on the spot, since your office was one of those that lost um, several employees, what did that represent for your office? On top of the loss of employees, I also had several employees that retired. So yes, we did lose a lot of institutional knowledge um, over the last eight years. Um, because several retired and they've been replaced with newer employees. So um, Kevin's correct that most most of us have representative employees, and so if you're laying somebody off, that person may be the newest person who may have least amount of knowledge in the office. Um, that actually didn't happen in a couple cases because it's also not by seniority but maybe in the class that you're working in. And so I did have a couple people who had been with me for a very long time but because they were in a lower class and have nowhere to bump or move to because of their seniority were the ones that were laid off. So it's very different throughout the county and how that works. Um, so I did lose a little bit, yes, definitely. How, how, did, uh, how did that um, affect the service level in your office, in the treasurer's office? Well, definitely for employees, morale was down. I mean, they're asked to do more. 
um, can answer more questions and do more with less available time to do it or less staff to back them up or cover. Um, we could not have done it without the reduced hours. There's just, it's just not functionally, cannot operate our day-to-day -day processes without having some time away from the public um, to do those jobs. So without that, we would still be struggling. Thank you. I have a related question. Um, what kind of feedback have you been getting from the public about reduced services? Is there satisfaction or is there complaints about I'm not getting the services <coughs> that I want or need? I think if they can get to us in the, in the timelines in which we're available to help them, they're getting that help timely and I don't care. But most of them, you know, they work 8 to 5 and they're only up with 9 to 4, so it's very difficult for them to get in and get what they need from us because we're not open long enough for them to do that and they're having to make that extra time. Um, but we also see, I mean, there's just a change in dynamics for my particular office, except at property tax time, they still like to come in and pay their taxes in person. You know, there's so much more online payments. We're just doing so much more electronically. You know, they don't need to come in and have a physical, you know, meeting with us one on one. Um, but when they do, you know, then we hear the complaints, obviously, that we're not available when it's convenient for them. Can I just say a word about this as, as a new guy, too? And what I would say is in my office, there is just zero margin for error. Um, we have an election going on right now, um, school district election in three districts, small districts. I have a two-person election staff. Next week, one of half of my staff is going to be out during election period because of a family emergency. You know. I mean, that is no way to run a railroad. Um, and, you know, the, in our licensing section, you know, right now the Mountain View uh, sub-agent is closed. And so the only place that you live in Sheldon to get your tabs renewed is in my office. And come up to any time, and there are going to be 10 or 12 people in line, and I've got staff at the counter, I mean, every staff person at the counter from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., um, and there's a line all the time, and you know, phones go in and certain. I mean, it, it's a lousy way to run a business, but it's you know, it's the situation we're in. Um, you know, I knew this going in. This is not a surprise to me, but um, you know, long term, what this does to your employees that are still there is terrible. Um, I've got a fabulous staff. Um, and they're working their butts off. Um, you know, I mean, people don't get lunches. I mean, literally, the staff, they don't get lunches. Um, because it, they can't. Because they'd rather serve the people who are standing in the line. That's the reality. Thank you. Does anyone have the number of the property tax exemptions that are uh, provided in Mason County? People in a certain income level, right, receive a property tax exemption. I don't know that number off the top of my head. I do have it in my annual report to the citizens. 2018 is not there yet, but um, um, that number is available, and I apologize. I don't know off the top of my head. I'm going to take this down because this is my personal comment, not me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I live in the city of Shelton. And if you are considering a criminal justice center, I think it needs to include the sheriff's office, the courts, and um, the, yeah, somebody else um, that just slipped my mind. And, it need, and the jail, thank you. And they need to be located in Mason County. Your decision to purchase Olson Furniture, which you seem very proud of, is a wrong move for the city of Shelton. And I have yet to see how much money you're anticipating spending on bringing that building up to snuff so that it can actually function the way you envision it. So, just my two cents. I, I have a related comment about the purchases of that building. I'm just always stunned that the idea about uh, ocean rising, 
never seems to be discussed when we're talking about investing in downtown. And uh, I, I, I've never really heard a plan for dealing with that, and I, and I just kind of was surprised to hear you were investing all that money down there without really talking that through. Do you mean literally the ocean rising, or is it? Yeah, no, okay. I, I mean literally <laughs> the ocean rising. Um, or the fact that if there was a tsunami that came down Puget Sound, where do you think it ends? Probably rather be here than Olympia, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but two, it's just I don't want to interject, but to that point, as a person who lives in Olympia, we have received several months ago, uh, it's, it's a chart that shows us exactly where they estimate, because downtown is a big issue, where they estimate loss of land like in 2000, let's say 30, 2040, et cetera. It's been well thought out, et cetera. I was happy to see I'm going to escape the flood. But, <laughs> but if that, that is very important. Yeah, I, I, and so if I could just maybe address like a couple of the joint concerns. So um, as part of the criminal justice working team, we've been We've been going back and forth, and this predates <coughs> my time on the commission as well, but how to address the facility issues that we have in our criminal justice system. As you know, we have a 100-year-old courthouse building that's physically limited, limited by historic preservation standards, and you know, what, we can, what we can and can't do there is, is dictated to us, um, so that's, that's one item. As we looked at previous, uh, previous plans to address the criminal justice system, Doing a complete criminal justice facility that includes the sheriff's office, includes a jail, includes a courthouse, includes a, you know, the prosecutor, a public defender's office, the price tag on that was north of $100 million that I would have to come and ask you for. And as you can, as, as you can hear in the room today, there are a lot of needs in county government, and I think it's difficult to come out and say, but I want to build this building for $100 plus million. <laughs> Um, we had an opportunity to, uh, to purchase the Olson Furniture Building. It was no secret to anybody in the private sector that that building was for sale. Uh, the Olson family, when they were going out of business, did a great job of putting the, all over the windows, going out of business. Uh, you know, and so it was no secret that that building was going to become available. I saw an opportunity to address our critical facility shortage in the courts uh, at a dollar figure that was far less than the roughly $40 million it would be to purchase uh, land and build a new building. Um, we're currently going through the process of, of uh, seeking out architecture and engineering estimates on the building. There's a lot of work that we can do in-house. We have a very talented and long-standing facility staff uh, that, that can do a lot of the work, uh, and that will help on the cost saving side. But uh, you know, it would be, I believe, in my, in my opinion, it would have been short-sighted for us to look past this building uh, when we're looking at a hundred million plus uh, dollar price tag on building a, uh, an entire criminal justice facility. As far as where it's located, we, have to, we do have to keep in mind some of the environmental issues. There's a lot of buildings, as many of you are probably well aware, in, in town that are built uh, you know, on pilings and, you know, there's, there's some concerns about what's underneath the roads and, and I, I get all of that. Uh, when it comes to the courts and where we locate our Superior Court, we have to keep Superior Court located in the county seat. So within the city of Shelton, uh, as well as all of our business needs to be uh, conducted at the county seat, which has to be in the city of Shelton. Um, you know, so unless we're going to look at, uh, you know, taking property up in this area to build, um, to build a whole new facility, there are limited options when it comes to where we site uh, our county, county government buildings. We could have, um, by that same token, we could have moved district court out of Shelton altogether um, because district court doesn't have the same requirements as superior court. Um, we could have moved them, say, to Belfair. Uh, I'm sure Commissioner District would like a big project in, in his district and have another person hook up to the Belfair sewer that we talked about. Uh, but but we, we, did, we did consider, uh, you know, the future of, of Shelton's downtown core. Um, you know, we, we want to keep those court employees, those people that use the court facilities, we want to keep them in the downtown core because a lot of them 
uh, once they're done, you know, paying off their parking tickets or they're, you know, they're there on their lunch break, you know, they're going to hopefully stay downtown and spend some of their money <coughs> in the restaurants and, and do some uh, some of that kind of stuff downtown. And so this was a this was an opportunity for us to um, address a critical need in our court facilities, uh, as well as find a way to keep uh, all of our staff and people using uh, district court services uh, in the downtown core. Um, we'll certainly, uh, certainly understand that a lot of, uh, you know, that not, uh, frankly not a lot, I've only heard from a, a couple of people prior to this uh, concern, that we had three people come and testify uh, at our multiple public hearings uh, at the county building. So, you know, these things are publicized, they're published, they're out there, we don't do anything in, in secret. Um, there's the Open Public Meetings Act uh, that requires us to make decisions in public and deliberate them in public. I encourage you to get involved on the other side of decision making uh, when we have these debates. Obviously, as I said, we have a, a big decision to make in the, in the coming months uh, regarding the recommendations of the Citizens Budget Committee. We have decisions to make regarding uh, a new jail uh, facility. So, um, you know, I, I highly encourage you and all the members to uh, come see us and come be a participant in those meetings. Let's Any other questions? Brenda, because we have some more presentations. Right? You want to go to the additional questions? Okay. Go to, to your next <coughs> part of your agenda. Do you want me to no. go? Thank you. Uh, yes, whoever wants to speak to these. Okay, so um, of course, the again, infrastructure is a critical um, uh, issue for uh, for local governments. Mason County is uh, is included in that. Um, under the state's growth management act, they, you know, we had to establish these urban growth areas. That's where the state wants to drive all your development and growth. And when you do that, they say you have to have urban services. Urban services include sewer systems. Uh, as you go into the Wayback Machine and you look at when the Belfair Sewer was conceived and built, uh, it was right around again that Great Recession timeline. And so there were some, uh, you know, there were some things about it that, that became, uh, you know, untenable from a financial perspective. We're continuing to subsidize it. I agree that, uh, that subsidizing it uh, is not uh, in the best long-term financial interests of the county, but it's where we are in the short term because we have to be. We have to make good on those, uh, on those payments. Um, and you know, and I, I I do believe that we are making incredible progress on uh, on, on solving that issue. We have uh, we're going out next week. I uh, have been working with uh, our local legislators on a capital budget request to uh, do a partnership with the Puget Sound Industrial uh, Corridor uh, with the Port of Bremerton and the City of Bremerton. This would allow us to uh, open up area for for growth and development where it makes sense in Belfair, in the urban growth area, as well as get um, funding partners uh, to help make that happen. So uh, we're going to be going to the legislature next week to ask for, for funding in the capital budget. Our legislators have been very supportive of those efforts. Uh, and, and so I encourage you to uh, keep an eye out on that. Uh, and so you know, hopefully, by virtue of, of getting those dollars into the system, uh, we'll be able to help turn the tide uh, on it financially. Could, could we, any, any questions there? Um, this, this is a drop in the bucket of the sewer question, but what's wrong with Russellwood? Why, can someone tell me how much the people there pay for their sewer and how much the county is supposed to pay? And why did, why did it go so south at Russellwood? Why is it so expensive? And what happened? So there are lots of separate, there are lots of private sewer companies. So there's a, Hurstine Island, they get along all right. They pay for their own sewer. <coughs> so Commissioner Nolan would admittedly have more history on, on this one than, than I do. You know, and I, I mean, I don't want to oversimplify it, but you know, in most cases we have aging infrastructure and they require you know, a lot more um, attention from, from staff and from outside contractors to maintain and improve uh, that. So I, you know, I think that's a big driver of the cost there. Um, Do the sure. people that live there pay? I, I, well, I live there and we pay one we pay one thirty four a month for I think three or four years and now it's going up to one forty five because it's going to be metered water. Okay. And that's sewer and water. 
So uh, the bill fare pays, is it $99 yes. per month? What is it they pay, Randy? Yes, they're paying approximately $99, but there's a big difference. Uh, they don't have water. Okay. This, this is a complete different system. Uh, as was explained by Commissioner Schutte, he's really accurate on it. Uh, it's an aging system, but they're also have to do meters, they're doing a bunch of other stuff. And there's aging issues when it comes to the water system itself and, and plenty of leaks. Uh, the one big difference between the Harsin Island one and the Russellwood one, the Harsin Island one was paid for by the county, taken care of by the county, made into a, a situation where they were completely flush and doing extremely well before they, they got it back. That makes it, there's a big difference in comparison with Russellwood, which was already on the major decline, and I'm sure before Russellwood would want it. To, to take it, and there's no companies that want to take these, I assure you. We looked around when it came to the Belfer sewer, but if you have a huge debt, they don't have the profit. Yeah, I'd like to make one correction, Randy. The, the county did have the Hartstein Point Water Sewer District for quite a long time, and the decision was made in that community where I live um, to become an independent water sewer district. In the process, we, after we gained control of it, we discovered that, I hate to say this, but it preceded all of you, but the county really did not do a very good job of maintaining the infrastructure. And we've paid a lot of money <laughs> uh, to try to put that infrastructure back together. And it's been a long process. We too have leaks and everything else. So, uh, so these are big issues, of course for whatever the district is, but I, I just had to correct that. Well, as I said, it was before my time, but what yeah. I meant was financially sound in comparison to the other systems. Yes, yes, and that was one of the reasons for it. Yes. So, Michelle, could you just tell us uh, approximately what you're paying per month? Well, actually, um, it's probably pretty close to what Rhoda was saying, but we've made we've had to make some improvements in it. Um, you know, over time, so we're paying for those as well. But probably pretty close to that, maybe a little bit less, but not much. Our system is very well maintained. They keep on top of it all the time. It's been very impressive, and um, it's, a, it's a beautiful system, and I think it's increased our property values having a sewer. Mm -hmm. It's been a good thing, but I don't know about the financial and how it's all put together. I would just interject too that Russellwood is a small sewer, mm -hmm. so there are not very many connections to that. So right. there's a, a you know a large amount right. of funding that is borne right. by a few people, fewer so, people. Right. And at the end of their capacity, yeah. what they can do is they can't. It's not like they can expand. Right. Any other comments on or questions about Russellwood or Belfair? Okay, so. We'll go on then. Oh, uh, go ahead. Michelle. Do, do you have something more that you want to present? We've got uh, the postage for voters oh, okay. yeah. to return balance. Yeah. Ready, can I take a crack? Uh, oh, sure, question please. Forward, uh, so the, the situation with, with postage is that included in the governor's budget is funding to pay for postage for all elections. Oh. We expect that to stay in the governor's budget and for it to be funded. So I don't anticipate going to the county commissioners to ask to pay postage for return ballots. For the, for the February special, uh, we are going to provide return postage on the envelopes and we're charging that to the school districts. I've had conversations with all the superintendents. It's gonna cost them more money, but they understand the importance of not going back and forth on sometimes postage is paid and sometimes it isn't. I wasn't going to go back, but I don't anticipate having to ask the Board of Commissioners to pay for postage. What uh, uh, municipalities or what school districts will be on the special election? Uh, Hood Canal, Pioneer, Southside. If I could just maybe appreciate Patty's comments on that, but let me provide a little bit more context too. So, uh, as you may recall, last year this this emerged as an issue when King County decided to pay for postage on all of their ballots. And what it did was it created a uniformity issue in some of their, uh, their districts. So if you think about our county and where we have fire or um, school districts that overlap with other counties, you would have a disparity in those if one county paid and another county didn't pay. 
What that should tell you is that is something that is the state's responsibility to fund. When you have something as critical as that that overlap county boundaries, uh, the state should the state should be you know taking that tab up. And I, I appreciate Patty's comments on that. And I, I hope you're right that it will remain funded. Just a broader issue about election funding. Tomorrow I'm going to uh, talk to the Santa State Government Committee about the auditor's primary legislative priority, which is fair share funding. So the, the, the quick uh, description of this is, in even number of years, the state pays nothing towards the cost of running elections, even though more than half the ballot is state measures, and that cost is entirely borne by the county. Uh, we are, are the auditor's highest priority, <laughs> legislative priority is fair share funding, which is the state's going to write a check. We are asking the state to write a check to pay for if they're if they are half the ballot is state and federal races that the state would pay for half the cost of the election. Um, it is it is sponsored uh, by Senator Hunt, who's the chair of the committee. So I feel pretty good about it getting out of committee. The money is not in the governor's budget. You know, that's going to be the hard thing. I think you know, conceptually everybody thinks this is a great idea. Um, finding the money to fund it uh, remains, will remain an issue. So could you just uh, clarify them? So for 2019, elections in 2019, you and all throughout the state will pay for the so, return post. So the February election, the the school districts are going to pay for the return post. They're going to pay for it. Okay. Yeah, that that's how the February specials happen. Is we bill the districts for the cost of the election. It doesn't come out of the county budget. To include the return postage. Correct. Okay. Uh, we expect that beginning the next by July one, the next biennium, that it, that paying for postage will be part of the governor's budget or the, the approved legislative budget and will be funded. So in 2020, there are going to be a lot more elections. Correct. And we, we expect that for the next biennium, that it will, that return postage will be paid for by the state for all elections. Okay. One of the things I would note there is that the county has to print this money almost yep. always first right. and get reimbursed by the state. Mm -hmm. So we still have to budget for those expenses and, and get that money back. So it's a give and take. I just want to be sure everybody was aware of that, that, you know, this money is going to come to us on January 1st and we're going to be able to spend it. We're going to have to be reimbursed for whatever those costs are. And so that money is being fronted by the county. You know, we so appreciate the perspectives from each of you and your willingness to share it with us. It really is uh, quite informative to have, to have you present and, and discuss this with us. So then the, the next uh, is uh, the brochure, the voters brochure. So I'll just say, so I know this was a, a priority of, of Patty's when he was running last year. Certainly appreciate him um, advocating for that. Quite frankly, we'll discuss it if and when the auditor brings it forward for his, his budget, um, you know, and, and handle it then and um, debate the, the pros and cons and see what the financial uh, ability of us to do that is. Have I think in years past, have we? Many years ago. Yeah, we, many we, years ago. We, we've yeah. been putting it online, is what, what uh, uh, the auditor has been doing. Is there a con to printing the brochure? There's a cost. The cost. The cost only? I mean, well, the, cost. Cost. <laughs> <laughs> the, the whole The whole day we've been talking about the cost only. only. Is the only <laughs> How, what, what kind of cost are we talking about? It must be a drop in the... What are we looking at, Patty? About. It's like 50000 wasn't it? Per per <coughs> election. Per yeah. election, yeah. Something so like primary, that. general, per election. And then you've got you to remember that. You have to be able to ship it out to everybody and everything. And yeah. then it's not the same as a postcard. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of costs there. We, the, we, we are able to have it printed <coughs> as an insert in the state voters pamphlet and so we're not paying postage we, we pay the marginal cost of the postage so but yeah it you know it is it is that versus 
um, a, you know, a deputy sheriff on the street at night. I mean, those are the those are the choices that the commissioners yeah. get to make. Yeah, and that's that's what uh, you wrestle with is you know how to prioritize and what's mandated, and and what what we can't afford. But I I suspect that from a league perspective, the brochure is seen as uh, valuable. Am I wrong? No, anything that educates the public and encouraging voting is what we're all about. Randy. But I hope you'll understand if we don't take it that on as a question, that would be inappropriate because that would be conducting a meeting on something that will actually come before us. Right. And that for us to have that conversation, that's why we have one person that's talking on that. Fair enough. You know He's doing a great job. We know where we stand too. So, okay. Well, are there other questions? I have one. Oh, okay. Um, so I had a question about how advisory boards and volunteers from uh, the citizens coming forth are um, are uh, applied to committees and so forth that the board uh, has. So, uh, for instance, when when there is an opening for a position and it's publicly put in the paper and citizens come forward as volunteer for that board. Um, I know, for instance, when I <laughs> applied for the Housing and Behavioral Health Board, um, that the commissioners uh, recruited somebody else. And I wonder how often that's done. Do you recruit folks for these committees? Um, most often, or do you have people come forward, um, and how do you make those decisions? Well, I can only speak for myself, obviously, but you know, is is we we have a number of citizens advisory boards that we have appointment authority over, uh, and as we advertise those boards and those positions come up, uh, there is certainly um, certainly I consider people in my district that I think would be helpful to have on that, that helpful to have, uh, have as part of those committees. And if they're willing, they take the time and effort and fill out the application. And, um, but I, I wouldn't conflate encouraging somebody to apply for a board with it being a done deal that that person gets appointed. I can tell you I go into all interviews with citizen applicants with an open mind. And, uh, and, and, and frankly, a point based off of those interviews and who I think will best represent the interests uh, of the county in their particular, their particular uh, district. So it, it is absolutely on a, on a case by case basis. Um, that being said, I think, again, speaking for myself, I think I have an obligation to uh, reach out to people that live in my district that have uh, specific skill sets that I think might be valuable uh, as part of the conversation. Um, and and a point from there. Brenda, mm -hmm. is your committee report going to include the recommendations of the citizens' advisory uh, committee, or were you going to address that in any way? Today? We can we we have not actually talked about that. Um, perhaps we could get back to you on that. And I, I just I want to go back to that. I, I, I that question I, because I. You know, I think if it the the way it's stated is it sort of impugns our motives and uh, as appointees, it's um, I can again those are those those interviews are held in open public session. Those those you know people step forward and are interviewed and everybody's given uh, a fair a fair interview. The questions are all the same. Um, the answers may be different. Certainly, the backgrounds are different, um, and and we appoint based on those interviews. So. I don't want there to be this sort of thought that everything is sort of preconceived and we just go through the motions. Um, that's certainly not how I conduct those. I think there was a question over here. Kevin, yeah. when people come to your meetings at the either the morning me meetings or the evening meetings, is are the public is the public allowed to ask questions and give their input, or is it just an informational session? So typically how we've run our Monday workshop briefings, those have not been, um, there, there isn't a public comment period.
period. Um, if somebody in the audience is, um, you know, we, we have from time to time taken staff uh, comment in when it's appropriate, but generally speaking, those aren't, aren't for public deliberation. It's for um, commissioner uh, deliberation, and then we decide from that what goes on our agendas and what maybe needs a little bit more work or thought. Um, on our Tuesday meetings, uh, whether it's a regular meeting uh, or if it's a fifth Tuesday meeting that we have in Belfair, um, usually uh, we do have a public comment period then. Uh, and at regular meetings that have, that have a public hearing item, then there's obviously public uh, testimony taken at that time too. But that, that, that I just want to also add, uh, those aren't the only times for you to express your opinion or engage with your elected officials. We are always available via phone or email uh, or to set up a, an in-person appointment. Um, you know, we are, to the extent possible, very much full-time commissioners. Um, we take the job very seriously. Um, we know that there's a lot at stake in the community. Uh, and so I, you know, I would highly encourage you that if you don't make it to those meetings uh, or can't, um, that there are other avenues to communicate with us as well. All subject to public records. Well. Ro Rhoda, you have a uh, comment or question? Didn't you, did you say that you, you don't have public comment before the Monday meetings in Shelton? Did you say you don't do that? I thought you did. On our Tuesday, Tuesday meetings we do. Tuesday. Tuesday. Tuesdays are our regular business meeting where we take act, we take action from the dais. And so there's a, there's a, you know, a set agenda, you know, where we do, you know, we, we get all the correspondence that has come to the commission. We get uh, public comment um, from from members of the public. They can comment uh, for a 15-minute period on items that we're not taking action on that day. So that's Tuesday time. morning at 9? Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Randy? Uh, you know, as we close, I wanted to actually answer the very first question that was asked. And it, it goes back to this in the communication aspect. You know, you were asking, you know, is it okay? Is it good to talk to one commissioner? But when I was a court commissioner many years ago, I came across an attorney general's opinion that said, if you are elected, even though you're, you are selected to go on the ballot by a district, if you are elected by the county or the district as a whole, and you're working as the budget as a whole, you represent the entity as a whole. That was the thing that came out. And you know, it's funny with communication, how, how, how do we communicate? Anybody remember the old Batman series? They wanted Batman, they put the light up in the air. <laughs> well, for me, it seems to be Facebook. Everybody's taken to go to Randy Netherland, Randy Netherland, Randy Netherland, and my phone number is out there everywhere. And you'd be surprised, somebody joked the other day, they came, many people, not one, many apologize that I get pulled into so many different things, because uh, it happens so much for just about everything. One made a comment about uh, plumbing, next thing you know, you can be plumbing. We did. We actually did get one, and we did fix our plumbing for her and help her out. But, uh, Aside from that, it is not only common for me, because I put my phone number out there everywhere, to use over 3,000 minutes in a month. People call for everything and anything. I have been called uh, because they were upset that I haven't done anything about the mosquito issue. Uh, there's too many mosquitoes in this county. The one that I remember the most when I first started was I should be ashamed of myself because I, I was there a year and I had not addressed the smell issue in uh, 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 as you're coming up Highway 3. Uh, that uh, that salmon stream there that that somehow is my fault and I should have addressed it I should have fixed it and I told him I'm working on it but I'm not sure what to do. Uh, <laughs> People uh, tie and eye all the time. Yeah, if yeah. anything, I was, I, was, I was chair of the Hood Canal Court Council, I'm trying to put more fish in there. So. Well, well, now, you, now you have work on it. Yeah, yeah. 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 now I have work on And as for your other question about losing the integrity of people when we let them go, I remember when I first took this job. I honestly thought I was going to clean house, get rid of a bunch of people, stuff like that. Remember that. I, I did. Only problem was, it had already happened before I got there, and the people that were left were invaluable. We had already cut ourselves so far to the bone that they were barely able to do the jobs they were doing. What you think on the outside is one thing. When you're on the inside, it's a whole other ballgame. I want to give compliments. Because although we've had to, she's always gotten her job done every time as long as I've been here and done it except in an exceptionally uh, gracious manner. And one of the battles that happened you saw in the public is we were at a situation where somebody had to be cut. There was no more to cut in some of these departments without completely devastating them. 
completely. And we're shocked they were able to pull off what they did with what they had. So yes, if you cut, you do lose not just the memory, but sometimes you can, right, point, you can lose the ability to do the job. Well, are these contracts privatization? Say it one more time. The, the, the contracts Brendan talked about, the con the independent contracts are, up, contract. service contracts are up to 8%. And, Personnel is down a certain amount. In, in some areas, well, a lot of them are using those we use for different things. For example, uh, uh, our courthouse security is a contract. Uh, interpreters are contracts. We have a lot of other, there's a lot of things that are required by law to do that we had nothing to do with, but we still have to find a way to make it happen. Quite awesome. often that's done by a contract. We've run way over, so I'm going to say thank you so much uh, for uh, helping us out here today and all your questions. It's been great. Thank, thank you so you much. Thank you.